Good evening. I'm Neville Acheson. Welcome to The Book Show. We've got a great show tonight. Uh, I'll be interviewing a little later Richard Webster, one of New Zealand's best-selling authors. But first of all, let me say hello to my co-host, John Reynolds. John, how are you? I'm good, Neville. Always pleased to be here. All right, yes. great. And always great that you're bringing us the news from the world of books. What's Indeed. happening in well, the I world thought, um, we, the book I'm going to talk to about later in the program is uh, David Hackett Fisher's book, and that's from the world of books. He's an American author, very well known in many circles, but he's written this amazing book called Fairness and Freedom, and it compares New Zealand and the United States in oh, all right. areas. Yeah. So we'll come back to that. That's yeah. just come out, and it's uh, all the American reviewers have said what a good book it is about America, and completely ignored the fact that <laughs> half of the book about is about New Zealand. So I thought that was quite curious. Yeah. But I thought because we were around uh, the sort of Anzac Day period that we'd have a look at a few New Zealand books about Anzac Day and the war. They just keep coming out, don't mm. they? Because it was such a huge war and there's so many stories out there. Yep. And so people and keep still writing. And still being uncovered. Still being well. uncovered, yeah. yeah. There's one on Crete, for example, and you'd think they've just about written everything that on Crete that you could possibly imagine. But it's called Men of Valour. And it talks more about the men that fought in Crete and it doesn't get into who was to blame for the retreat and all that sort of thing, because a lot of people um, tended to blame General Freiburg. Mm. Although the, the author says that Freiburg, on the eve of the battle, told his headquarters back in England or wherever that forces at my disposal are totally inadequate to meet the attack envisaged. We're not going to win this, guys. Yes. We'll give it our best shot, mm. but don't blame me. But it's very good, and it, it, it does, unlike a few documentaries I've seen on Crete, highlight the role that mm. the Kiwis played. And I was very interested to read that. In fact, my second name is named after a very good friend of my dad's who was killed the day before I was born. Right. He was killed on Crete. And so I always feel a bit of an affinity to Crete. Yes, indeed. I've never been there, but it's on my bucket list. All right. So one day yeah, I should do one so. One day. One day. Another one that's, that's quite on a totally different note. Uh, um, a guy called PDF Cook has brought out a book called Fit to Fight. And it's about the uh, compulsory military training that took place in New Zealand from, I think it was 1956 until 1972, where all young men could be called up and go to compuls CMT, we yes, used to call it, yep. I remember. Yeah. I never went, I missed out. Well, I, I remember, yeah. I, was, I think it was, I was probably the first year after it was compulsory for everybody to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and the year that I um, was due to go, they introduced the ballot yes, um, yes. on your birthday. Yes. Or based around your birthday. Yes. And I, and I missed out and, um, and felt quite pleased about that, I'd have to say. Well, well apparently 100,000 young men were called up for right. that. Yeah, put a, a huge number of people through that CMT. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, and I hear arguments about the value of that in terms of uh, peacekeeping and mm. uh, civil defence as mm. well, mm. and yeah. as well as all of that interesting mm. stuff about growing up quickly and meeting yes. other people and That's issues right. around discipline. And getting very fit and all the rest yes. of it. So the book, it's quite a tome, so it's not something I think you'd sit down and read in a night because there's a lot of, um, a lot of records and right. appendices that are probably aren't necessary. But I don't think anyone else has bothered to write about that and a lot of people of our generation, men anyway, were affected by that. Then another one that's on another war, the war that never ended. And that's, it's very appropriate at the moment because it's about Korea. Right. Now we've got uh, the third lunatic in Korea, who mm. su he succeeded his grandfather and his father, causing, uh, causing all sorts of trouble in North Korea. And this is about the 6,000 New Zealanders who fought in Korea, and 45 of them were killed. And a number of, he's done interviews with these people, and a number of them have said it was a total waste of time, because at the end of the day, the peninsula remained divided. I don't think well, the writer, Pip Desmond, it's a Penguin book, Pip Desmond says that, that the Korean soldiers never really got the accolades that the First World, World War I and World War II soldiers got because a lot of people thought, well, that was a waste of time and a waste of a lot of men, yep. and nothing happened. But then others have said, well, South Korea is a thriving community and a thriving country, so maybe it was worthwhile. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I was talking to somebody just the other day who had been in Korea. K force in Korea, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and and he felt that way. He felt like, whatever it is, thirty, forty years on, mm. um, it was pointless, mm. and he's lived with that ever since because it, it's still disturbed, still 
at each, other, at each other's throats. Yes, yeah. yes, it was a brutal conflict as yeah. well. Mm. Yeah, whether it was any good or not, I, don't mm. know, I guess the men still have to live with those memories. Yeah. So there's three books, one on Crete, one on the compulsory military training, and another one on the war that never ended and is still going, because they're still at war, North and South yes. Korea, aren't they? Well, it's still going, and as you said earlier, mm. the, our, our voyage of discovery into all of those issues around mm. warfare and our involvement is still going on as well. Absolutely. John, thank you so much. Okay, you must All be. right. Okay. Well, we'll talk to you a bit later. Yes, And indeed. in the meantime, we will uh, leave you there. And right after the break, we'll be back with Richard Webster. If the book you are reading late at night is not helping you sleep, maybe it's time for Sleep by Remy Fairman. This natural product helps you to have a normal and healthy sleep. It calms a racing mind and helps with anxiety. Suitable for men and women. Wake up refreshed and able to remember the story. Available from leading pharmacies and health stores. Relax. Hello and welcome back to The Book Show. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's guest, Richard Webster. Richard, Good nice evening. to see you. How are you? Very well, thank you. Richard Webster, New mm -hmm. Zealand's best-selling, least-known author. That's, that's right. That, there was a quote put on the back of a novel I wrote called Enemy Within. And I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if it was good or not, but it's probably true. So, so the curiosity might be, why is that true? Well, most of my books, are, I've had 112 published so far, but most of them have been in the mind, body, spirit market. Right. So they get sold in, in niche bookstores, so, and uh, you sometimes see them in places like Whitcalls, but not too often. All right. So uh, I'm well known to a small audience in New Zealand. Right. But uh, so there's a lot of those around the world, fortunately. Yes, well, I was going to say, a lot of niche bookstores around the world because you've sold a significant number of books. Uh, about um, 11 million now. 11 million. Mm -hmm. Across how many um, titles? 112. 112 books, mm -hmm. 11 million mm -hmm. copies. Yes. In how many languages? 29. 29. Yeah. So that's impressive. Is it surprising that we don't know about you? In New Zealand? I, I don't think so. I, d I don't seek publicity in, in New Zealand. Um, it's a very small market. I, I go to the States once a year and yeah. I spend a, a month or so there. And that's a huge market, you know, 300 right. million people. And because I've got an accent over there, it makes me um, welcome on television. Because right. uh, people have got the television on their homes and they're not listening. Yes. Someone comes on with a different accent and they go yes. uh, and have a look. Probably better for me to do my promoting there rather yeah. than here. I also go to Europe once a year and go to the Frankfurt Book Fair and do different book signings and things in the UK and Germany. Right. Are you writing, and forgive me if it's impertinent, but are you, are you writing for about particular topics or are you writing for that particular market? I'm writing for that particular market. Yeah. But I used to be a ghostwriter and uh, I used to write books that were unbelievably boring for me. Yes. So um, I decided when I was going to write for myself that I would only write on topics that interested me. So what got you into writing in the first place? It was something I was born with, I think. Yes. I was always a keen reader. I, I started reading at a very young age. My parents were keen readers. And my mother had been a journalist before she got married. And her father spent his whole life trying to be a writer and didn't make it. And his aunt was Australia's best-selling writer in the 19th century. Right. So th there was a history of writing mm. going, going through the family. Uh, when I was nine, my favorite author came to town and he gave a talk at my local library. So I went, I'd never seen an author before, mm. and I was absolutely entranced. So uh, when I got, a few days later, he wrote a letter to the library thanking them for having him, which gave his address. So uh, I wrote him a letter and I got a charming reply back and my parents invited him home for dinner. So that was probably the most wonderful evening of my entire life. Right. He told me about how we used to travel the world in junk, uh, tramp steamers in those days, back in the 50s, and write books on the way. And I thought, gee, there couldn't be a better way of making a living than that. <laughs> so by the end of the evening, I decided I was going to be a writer too. And uh, I told him that. And he said, well, when you're 21, write to me and I'll give you some valuable advice. So I did. When I was 21, I, he was now living in the Cook Islands. And I wrote him a letter and I got this most wonderful reply back. And the essence of it was, don't do it. <laughs> but it was, too, it was too late. I was already underway. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I've heard, the other, the other influence was was Jack London. Yes, yes. When I, when I was in my probably late 20s, I visited Jack London's home north of San Francisco in the wine country. Mm. And he had a, a play farm there. It was a farm that he made no money, but he used to love playing on it. Mm. 
and uh, on his living room were his rules of work and one of them was to write a thousand words a day and when I read that a light bulb went off I thought wow if I wrote a thousand words a day 60 days I'd have a book if I kept on doing it I'd eventually get lots of books and sooner or later something would get published but get, by the time I got home I'd misremembered it I thought he wrote 2,000 words a day <laughs> so when I went back 15 years or so later I got the shock of my life when I found I'd been writing twice as many words a day <laughs> as I needed to. <laughs> but that worked for you? Yes, it worked for yeah. me. I still write 2,000 words a day when, right. I, when I'm working on a book. And then to your first book? Uh, my first book was actually published in 1972, right. and that was a book on censorship, which was bought by the first publisher I sent it to All right. and vanished without trace, thank goodness. I don't, I don't even own a copy. So someone <laughs> came to the house and bought my last <laughs> copy, and I phoned the publisher to get more, and they'd all gone. Yep. So um, I've... I haven't seen one since. <laughs> so have you had many pink slips in your career? Yes, yes, I've had, had a few. Um, uh, I've never just had a rejection slip. I've always had a letter, which is quite a good sign in, ac in actual yeah. fact. So yes, yes, I've had my share of those. I've, right. I've got several unpublished books yeah. in, a, in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So was there a point when you said to yourself, uh, this is going to do me for the rest of my life. This, I'm j enjoying doing this. I'm making a living. I'm supporting a family. Yes, yes. I gave myself five years, which was advice I got from Earl Stanley Gardner, who created the Perry Mason books. Mm. He was a lawyer and hated it. And he gave himself five years to make more money out of writing than he did out of law. Right. He didn't quite get there, but it, it was enough mm. to make him do it. So I gave myself five years to make more money out of writing than the other things I was doing at the time which included selling the Ginsu knife and, <laughs> yes. and doing magic shows and doing hypnotism shows and yes. uh, a bit of hypnotherapy, living by my wits really, a bit yes. of this and a bit of that. So it was a good time to do it because I did have time where I could focus on my writing. And I'd had books published in New Zealand, I'd had books published in the UK, but the money I made was next to nothing. So I looked for an American publisher and um, I read an article on Publishers Weekly about a company who'd sold a million copies of one author's books, and I thought, well, that's the publisher I want. So I sent away for their guidelines, which in those days you had to post away for and wait weeks yeah, for it to come yeah. back. And in the meantime, I bought a dozen of their books, and I just studied the books, the layout, the style, and everything, what, what they wanted. Mm. And then I wrote a book f with them in mind, and I sent it to them. And two weeks later, I got a phone call back in the early 90s, it was quite, quite something. And they said, we want it, what are you writing now? Well, I wasn't writing anything, but I said, oh, I'm actually halfway through a book on Celtic divination. <laughs> Goodness knows <laughs> where that came from. <laughs> and they said, oh good, when can we have it? And I said, oh, in three months probably. So I had to get busy and write that. So uh, that was my second book with them. Right. And uh, they were they've about to publish my 50th book with them. Right. Uh, that's Llewellyn Public. Mm -hmm. So that's extraordinary. And yet, you must have been accused somewhere along the line of, a, of an air of calculation, as it were, that perennial thing that says, do we write because we have to? Do we write because we want to make money? Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a mixture of both in there. Yes, yes, there yeah. is, and there is a mixture of both. Mm. Uh, uh, nowadays, I'm writing for my own pleasure, la la yes. largely, yeah. but initially it was definitely for money. And I belong to the New Zealand Society of Authors, who are a wonderful, wonderful organisation, but some of the people there um, put me down a little a little bit all right but in, in fact uh, one worked at a place where my daughter worked at and uh, he told her that i was a nice man but i'd sold out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, took, okay. I took that as a compliment yes indeed <laughs> well let's then have a look at something that's by richard webster so most recent uh publication yes uh, two bo two books came out at the same time and that's uh, th these two face reading for beginners and living in your soul's light Right, and so so that says you're working on them both at the same time. No, I wasn't. No. They both just happened to just be published ha just at the same time. Coincidentally, face reading, quick and easy. Yes. And so, what will I learn when I read this? Uh, the book's in two halves. Part part of it is on traditional Chinese face reading, which looks at the shape of someone's nose, how big their, how wide their mouth is, yep. um, all that sort of stuff. The second half is how to use people's facial expressions right. to. Um, to sell them things, to get on with people, all that sort right. of thing. This is um, both the, the sort of the, the philosophical and the, and the pragmatic as well. That, that's right. Yeah. And uh, I try to write how to do it books largely, so it's yes. a book on how to do these things. So, so who would want to buy one of these books? Well, this particular title, do you think? Um, 
I've got a large section on how to tell if people are lying. Right. And I think a lot of people are bought it for that reason. Yes. A lot of people are interested in body language. Yep. And uh, they would buy that because this is specifically on the face. Yes. And as a result of the success of this one, um, at the Frankfurt Book Fair last year, nine overseas publishers bought the rights of it. Right. So, and they all wanted a book on body language. So I had to come back to New Zealand and write a book on body language. Oh, right. Which is coming out next year. Yeah. So I'll have a pair. And the Chinese have been studying this for thousands of years. And so, living in your soul's light, this seems yes. to be a little closer to the heart of where you're really coming from. Yes, it is. Yeah. And uh, it came about accidentally. I, I uh, quite suddenly got pulmonary embolism, which was blood clots in my lung, and ended up in hospital. And uh, I, I almost died. So mm. um, when I came out, I was, uh, two days of my life have gone completely. I have no idea where I was. And uh, I woke up in hospital one morning, and the title of this book was in my head. Right. And uh, and uh, I had plenty of time lying there to think about the soul. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to get home and start writing. Of course, it wasn't that easy because when I got home, I had to recover a little bit. I didn't yes. have any energy for quite some time, and then I had to finish the book I was already writing. But I'd started started researching this. All right. So this is probably a more personal book than yes. a lot of my books. And so this is exploring your own soul, not just the soul. No, it's exploring the soul because right. I've, I've written it for people to, there are exercises in there for people to explore their own soul in All a right. sense. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. And so where would we buy these books? Um, you can buy them online fairly easily. Yes. Um, as far as bookstores are concerned, uh, Pathfinder Books um, right. is uh, probably the only one in Auckland. And uh, there are a number of New Age stores throughout, yeah. throughout the country and they would have them, I'm sure. Yeah, and I, and I get to find you out richardwebster.com I think it's called. Yes, that's right. That nature, that's right. Yes, yeah, it is. Exactly. Yes. And so that and that that's got your entire catalog there if people want to have a look at the other sorts of things. That yes, 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 yeah. I think I think 18 other books are Yeah. Mm. All right. Excellent. Thank you Richard. Really thank you. nice of you to come. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Yes, yes, and so have I. Enjoyed it immensely. And thank you. We'll be back with more of the book show right after this break. If the book you are reading late at night is not helping you sleep, maybe it's time for Sleep by Remy Fairman. This natural product helps you to have a normal and healthy sleep. It calms a racing mind and helps with anxiety. Suitable for men and women. Wake up refreshed and able to remember the story. Available from leading pharmacies and health stores. Welcome back. And uh, John, what a fascinating man. We're sort of going from the, from the really serious uh, stuff in the trenches to the psychic, and yes. now we're back to the serious. And he's, very, he's made a lot of money, apparently, well, like writing for well, the psychic. So you sell enough up. books, you yes. make some money, I guess. I guess, guess you, you do, indeed. yes. So yes. He's, he's an example to us all in that respect. Well, yeah. well, you can give us a few tips uh, from time to time. Oh, from time to time. On, um, yeah, yes. You've written a book about how to write books. How to write books, yeah. yeah writing your first novel. But you've got a fairly weighty looking I've tone. I've got a weighty looking this. tone. We'll just hold it up and then we'll show it later on. Freedom and Fairness, written by David Hackett Fisher, who's a, uh, an American academic. But don't be put off by, because a lot of academics write obscure stuff, but he writes very well. He was visiting New Zealand uh, during a by election in Selwyn in uh, 19, 1994 and he watched the election with great interest because he has a lot of interest in politics and he knew quite a lot about New Zealand and mm. New Zealand and the United States, their democracies and so he was interested in, in how ele our election uh, ran and he was listening to the rhetoric and he was reading the pamphlets and everything else and I'll just read from the book then it suddenly dawned on me that Selwyn's many candidates had little to say on the subject of liberty and freedom. Now you always hear liberty and freedom mm. in American mm. rhetoric, don't you? In the United States, the rhetoric of a free society is heard everywhere. Liberty and freedom are the founding principles of the, Uni of the United American Republic. Through many generations, public discourse in the United States has been a continuing debate over contested meanings of these two great ideas. But what he found in the New Zealand election is that we use the word fairness and fairness was the cornerstone of, he felt, of New Zealand society. Mm. That the fair go for the common bloke, which was one of Muldoon's ideas. Yeah. And then fair go was a very popular show. And he's gone through and he's traced in a lot of our political rhetoric and in our writing, fairness is discussed all the time. So the Americans talk about liberty, which gives them the right for individual development. Yeah. 
we, although also a democracy, from what he says, is that we feel that it's got to be a fair society. So everyone has a fair go. So no one wins uh, off the back of other people. Right. And so does he, does he dive at all into why that is? Well, he says a lot of it is uh, in terms of our origins, that New Zealand was populated by people who, who didn't have to fight for their freedom. Hmm. They just came out here. They didn't have to fight the British in order to win. Right. And, and so I think that's one of the reasons why Americans got this gun culture, because everyone was allowed to carry a gun because they had to fight against the yes. colonial oppressor. We never had a colonial oppressor. We were just part of them, weren't yeah. we? Well, well, and there, there is an argument as well about written constitutions that suggest yes. Uh, yes. Uh, at the time the American constitution was written, it seemed entirely appropriate to say you have the right to That's bear right, arms. Right to bear arms, yeah, yeah in defence of yourself. What he does, and he has an amazing insight into New Zealand society. I, I learned a lot just reading mm. his book from an American. He goes through everything. He looks at the Indians and he looks at the Maori. And he talks about going to a, a um, conference in New Zealand at a university and how the Maori ritual was part of the conference. And he said, and I'll quote him again, these Maori ceremonies were more than gestures. They set the tone for the events that followed. In substance, the meetings were highly professional, but in spirit, they seemed more like a family gathering. We witnessed some heated arguments, yet also a sense of kinship that rarely appears in big American conferences. Colleagues in New Zealand managed their disagreements in a spirit of reciprocity that's important to this nation, that's us. Maori rituals, he felt, were instrumental to that end. So I thought that was intriguing. It's a fascinating insight, yeah. isn't it? It is. And this is from an outsider. I mean, I'm tempted to say uh, he should meet that Danish woman who was here recently. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's right. We talked about half-naked savages and exactly. so on. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And missing the point entirely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He talks of women's rights, and, and that's, uh, that's an interesting chapter because um, women campaigned very strongly for the right to vote in the States, mm. as did our women. And um, we beat them to it. We, were, we had women's suff suffrage in 1893. He says the reason for that is, is our political system, that in New Zealand you only needed a simple majority in Parliament to get a bill through, and that was all that happened in New Zealand. Whereas in, in the United States it required a constitutional amendment, two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress, and approval from three quarters of the state legislature. Right. Holy cow! <laughs> yeah. Well, well, he's talking, of course, about relatively recent times. There, there used to be an upper house in New Zealand. Yes, that's true. That's true. But uh, no, he, so he um, and he he's got some of the more prominent figures in um, both in New Zealand women's suffrage uh, and uh, in in the states. He has Kate Edgar, for example, who was the first woman in the British Empire at the time to win a uh, bachelor's degree. Mm, mm. And I remember reading up on Kate because one of my students won a scholarship with Kate's name on it. Kate was allowed to go to the University of Auckland, finally, but she had to walk into the classroom with her eyes downcast, lest, I suppose, she uh, tempted any young man with the look yes. that women do, you see. But really? she got her degree yes. and became something of a leader. So Indeed. Uh, so that was, the, yeah. I One wonders whether she was allowed to look the Vice-Chancellor in the eye as she received it. <laughs> or keep her eyes downcast and say, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. He talks about racism, and of course there's tons of stuff he can write about in, um, in America. And we might say, well, we never had institutionalised racism. We never had uh, separate drinking fountains and coloureds only, and Maoris could ride at the front and mm. back of the bus and so on. And he talks about the Jim Crow laws, which were the laws that yeah. segregated people after the, uh, after the American uh, war of, um, between the states of the Civil War. He says, racism in New Zealand took on other forms. This existed more as a custom rather than law. And he talks about uh, Pukekohe, where he said uh, they confined Maoris to a neighborhood called the Reservation and excluded them from pubs, cinemas, and swimming baths. So he has enough insight to see that we weren't all perfect. No. And, uh, and there's a little snippet that I was not aware of yes. before either. No, I, had, I heard that years ago from a friend of mine who was right. raised in Pukekohe after the war. He mm. said, yes, there was a lot of racism, but it was never on the statute books. Right. And so he, he feels that um, you never got this tremendous resentment between black and white. Mm. Plus, of course, you never had the slavery here, which is a huge contribution 
to um, to the relationship, the yeah. historical relationship so, between the blacks and the whites. Yeah, and, now, and, so, and forgive me, because it, mm. it suddenly occurs to me, I mean, one of the things that I used to surprise my friends with was to remind them that the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi was 50 years before the Wild West. Yes. And people go, what? Yes. Um, mm. And it's stunning. But is yes. there anything, is there an issue of time here? Dif I mean, different sorts of immigrants? Um, to England and uh, to, from England to uh, the US and to New Zealand? I think probably that this, you had such a diversity of people that went mm. to the States, whereas most of our people came from England, and they, so they had a sort of a common understanding mm. of democracy and what was, what was fair. And as, as he says in his book, Fairness, it, this is part of, uh, of our belief. Interesting, he has a comment on the, on the Waitangi Tribunal for example, which he says has been constantly criticised for going too far or not far enough. Mm. <laughs> you can't win. But its work has had a major impact. And he said that as New Zealanders think about what might follow the Waitangi Tribunal, these principles are an active discussion once again. But his view is if the tribunal is abolished, it's likely that some other institutional process would follow it. Mm. So he feels it's a positive thing in spite of some of the issues. And it, it's... Um, because he points out there were many, many treaties signed with the Indians. So that the, the, the Treaty of Waitangi is, is not some unique event that happened in the old British Empire. Lots and lots of treaties were signed. We're probably one of the very few um, post-colonial countries that still keep that treaty and refer to it all the time. Mm. So that's, uh, that's another difference. Yes, yeah, so a final little quote on the subject of fairness. This is what Hackett writes, no nation in the world has more to teach than New Zealand, and no nation has more to learn than the United States. And I think that's pretty good for a country of four million people, isn't oh, it? Oh, we'll take that, John. We will yes, indeed. indeed. So that's Fairness and Freedom, David Hackett Fisher, most interesting book, which I'm sure you and anyone else would enjoy enormously. All right. Fairness and Freedom. Fairness well, and freedom. I'd have to say I'm not a great reader of, um, of non-fiction, mm -hmm. but I'm really fascinated to have oh, a look yeah, this, at this. This is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. John, as okay. always. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Neville. All right. Okay. Take Good. care. Right. And thank you. We'll be back next week. You take care. And in the meantime, good reading. <laughs>